so for all of our viewing audience throughout Northampton, Massachusetts, the country and the world, welcome to the May 3rd meeting of the CPC. As always, we begin with general public comments. Um, Lisa, do you want to speak or do you want to just wait? I'm happy to wait if. Um, Is that I all right? To speak then. Yeah, that's yeah. totally fine. Um, unless you have something to do that at this point, we would love to have you be present for our conversation after, and it shouldn't be all that long. Yeah, and I have. I mean, I have a little bit of information to pass out. And I can okay. speak to then. I think that makes more sense okay. if that's all right with you to sure. hang out that's totally a little fine. bit. Uh, approval of minutes. Sarah sent us one. What was it? March fifteenth. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, is there a motion for to approve? I move to approve. Uh, second. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, so moved. Uh, chair's report. So those of you that were looking at your email, perhaps you saw today the thing came in from the statewide um, uh, Community Preservation Committee, or whatever they call themselves, that we are to receive 15% in our state, um, whatever that's called, match, not match. In the first round. So there's two rounds. I finally figured out where they're getting this. So they subscribe to the Department of Revenue local reports. Okay. And I did that as well, so I got the same information. Okay. So there's, there's sort of two rounds of distribution. If a community only has a minimum 1% rate, then they will only get that first distribution. So those communities will only be getting about 15% this year, which is not very much. We get money in the additional two rounds because we tax ourselves at the, the maximum 3% amount. And that, that's the money that's sort of up in the air. So the 15% is in the minimum. first round. Yeah, so that's the minimum we'll get, which is not very much. But should be? Uh, it's around 150,000 or something, is that? Because we tax ourselves uh, yeah. at about a million? Yeah, uh, a little more than that. A little more than that. So it's what we, it's what we, 15% of what? We bring in. Yes. What so in addition to that, we'll get at least 15%. Ah, got it, okay. Match. All right, okay. Yeah. Um, and this, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, uh, does uh, that Boston and Holyoke and the other municipalities are not part of this this year. That they won't get anything until 2018 for some reason. They even though they voted themselves in, I thought it said we're going to go down from 50% in future cycles because this doesn't factor in Boston. Yeah, there is a, there is a there's a one year delay. Yeah. Yeah. One year delay. So we're really going to take a hit once yeah. Boston. So you're getting the match based on the prior years. Mm -hmm. right. Registry of deeds receipts, and they didn't since mm -hmm. they weren't part of the mm -hmm. the pot and for the whole year. They don't get all of that money. From. So, so we're really the last year we'll actually get that high amount. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless something involved. changes with the way the legislation is written. Yeah. So what what has been the round two and three percentage in prior years? Do you recall just very roughly? Is it another fifteen percent or less than that? While Sarah's searching for that, um, hopefully folks can stick around for a little because we have a special international star <laughs> among us whose name we will withhold, but it's going to do yet another yo-yo uh, grand finale to welcome us out of our last meeting of our spring cycle. So we will introduce him. Uh, that no one knows who that is, do we? But I bet he has a name tag. <laughs> so we um, in the past few rounds it got us up to about a thirty percent. Wow. So it wasn't so plus or minus another fifteen. Huh? Yeah. In the well, that's what was available in those years. But there's still, even though the, the largest communities aren't part of this new distribution, there were communities that signed on the previous year that now have to be accounted for. Right. Good. Okay, uh, moving right along to a financial review, Sarah. Uh, the only update I have is that we are cutting it so close with what we're spending this year that I may have to hold the recommendations 
to go to council a little bit longer than we usually do just to make sure we have enough money not to go negative at the end of the fiscal year. We should be fine unless people decided not to pay their taxes that we're doing May 1st. And when will you know when to submit? Uh, I, I can get another report from the auditors in about two weeks. Okay. And then you'll feel confident at that? At yeah, that. and if for some reason large taxpayers Ne neglected to pay their taxes, uh, we would have to hold them until after the beginning of the fiscal year. Okay, which would be July after until July. And that's which which mo most likely won't happen. It never has before. Great. Any questions for sir about that? All right. So moving right along to finalizing the funding recommendations, Sarah sent us uh, yesterday, or was it today? three city council orders for the three projects that we're funding. Uh, the CONSCOM fund, the um, uh, Hampshire and Expansion Project, and Lathrop Communities uh, small, uh, small grants. Uh, do we do motions on these, Sarah, or we do we? Yeah. We do. Uh, so let's go through them individually. And this is our time to uh, also add conditions, is that correct? If, if we have a condition that's so significant that we want to make sure it's reflected in the council order, then absolutely, otherwise we can hold them until the contract is phase. Okay. So let's begin as we did last time with sort of smallest to largest. Uh, the Lathrop one, um, is there a motion to approve this order? I move to approve with the change of the <coughs> date from September 16, 2015. New one. Oh, good luck. Way to go. Always someone like Linda with eyes that help move a project forward. I was unaware, Sarah, that winged euonymus, however you say that, was a, a, a invasive. To get rid of it sometime. Really? It doesn't seem to spread as much as some of the other ones do, but once it's, it's established, really it's really, really, really tough. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a, I think we had a motion. Do we have a second on the this? Second. Uh, any discussion? Is that um, next to the last whereas strong enough to do what we wanted to? I think one of the things we wanted to do was to um, publicize that this, that this was a public access area as well. And there was an um, internet something that was being discussed. On the web, web page. Yeah, yeah. yeah so maps. those were, um, the internet piece was a, an addition to the contract. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that would be repeated in this contract unless we wanted to make it extra strong in the council order. So remember that the council order is different from the contract. Um, okay. However, we could, uh, Jeff, if you were so inclined, get us there, just said increase the language of the whereas if you feel that's appropriate. I just think there are <clears throat> I think we should make sure that there's some kind of um, public disclosure. To it is open to the public and it's his um, CPA funds um, involved in it. And I just don't, that's a nice vague whereas, it's, that's kind of how I look at it. Could we say something like, whereas the applicant uh, uh, will uh, increase public awareness? Is that still too weak for you? No. No. I, it's, and then, you know, hopefully we have a discussion with them about how to do that. So could we say, whereas the applicant has welcomed public use of its popular trails, will increase uh, uh, public knowledge of the trails. Yeah, the public knowledge of the trails' existence. 
Chow's existence and publicity of the project to help to help raise awareness of this area. You getting that, Sarah? Mm -hmm. I'm good with that. Do you want to read it back to us, Sarah? Uh, whereas the applicant has welcomed public use of its popular trails and will increase public knowledge of the trails on the property as part of this project. Good. Good to go. I'm good. Any other discussion? Um, Sarah, so there's just typo-wise, there were two periods in the third whereas that was to reduce the basis of this good whereas. That's okay. There was none in the fourth whereas. <laughs> right. All humans out. <laughs> That's right. And as we all know. Extra and as well in the third one. Yes, there is. <laughs> After garlic mustard. I don't think you need them. No, I agree. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I think, are we ready to vote? Yes? All those in favor? All right. Let's see. Number two is the Cons Tom Fund 22685. We'll take a moment to look at that. Uh, is there a motion um, to approve this recommendation? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. A period at the end of the third, whereas. We got the date right. Yeah. Any other suggestions for language? All in favor? Opposed? Number three. Moving right along. Let's see, is there a motion to approve the Valley CDC one? Second? Second. Okay, give folks a moment to. There's a date on the top of that that I don't oh, understand. Right. Good eyes. So you did a nice job in. Valley CDC, but haven't gotten a response. I think uh, both, both are my contacts there on vacation. I was thinking maybe not specifying the number 31 just because the project could change slightly. And if it did, we'd have to go back and cancel, even if it were 30 or 32. That's a, that's a little bit funny. So, how would the language read? Uh, approximately 30. Approximately double. I mean, yeah. you just because you've got 15 in there. Or just eliminate entirely. Whereas a project will increase the number of affordable rental units at the existing property. I think it's all right to be somewhat specific. Um, I wouldn't have a problem taking this back to council if. It turned out there was was no increase, for example. So, approximately thirty. Yeah, I just I just say that it's that it's double. Okay. <laughs> Anything else that we can see? I I have a question about this. If 
we have this uh, amount going to a rather large project. Do we have language in the contract where, where it would come back if the other financing was you know, similar to what we did with the, the uh, courthouse? You know, yeah, it's a great point. Because it's 50,000, they're not going to spend they don't get anything else. Yeah, we, can, we should certainly specify that. But that would not be in the warehouses, that would be in the contract, is that correct? I, I would think so. Good. Yeah, I just, I just didn't know if they would start doing some expenditures, yeah. you know, before they had. Yeah. But yeah, they're not going to get the rest of that money for a year and a some half. period of time. So that, that could hang out there for quite a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as long as we have that explicit in the contract, that if additional funds, and we'll, we'll come up with language, I'm sure, sir, uh, are not received, then that 50000 is clogged back. Is that the word of the day? Uh, no. Well, they just wouldn't be able to spend it at all. Great. Thank you, Jared. But that's not a warehouse. That's no, no, that's, that's I'm fine with that. Okay. Any additional discussion on this? All those in favor? All right. Good to go on that. All right. So here we are, and we're joined again by Lisa Clausen sitting as she has for a few of our meetings in the back to help us with this discussion of uh, of our of our fair wage or wage theft uh, issue. Um, so. In the interest of perhaps time or something, uh, I thought perhaps I could begin by um, by going over a few thoughts that I had, if that's all right. You'll indulge me for a moment. Um, the first thing is, and, and we, we talked about this at the last meeting, um, I think sometimes we tend to be a, a reactive rather than a proactive group. We react to what what, what comes in rather than being proactive. And just to acknowledge that, that that's okay, that's what it is that we do. Um, but when we're looking at establishing uh, good, good relationships with contractors or relationships with contractors, uh, something that I think to consider is looking at language that goes beyond uh, wage theft issues. Um, to sexual harassment, to discrimination, to environmental compliance. There's so much out there. And that's just something that we should think about. That um, uh, we're, we're taking really sort of a specific thing and asking, in this case, contractors, subs, or grantees to, uh, to, to certify uh, uh, practices in regard to wage theft. Should we be asking them to be certified practices in regard to other things as well? Something to think about. For the purpose of this discussion, I think we, we, we should deal with wage theft, but perhaps at some point, rather than having individual groups come up to us, that perhaps we could be a little more proactive and actually expand. So that's something to think about. The second thing I thought is that we should, um, perhaps we could begin by separating out the, the grantee from a contractor and subs. That I think, um, uh, that that's real important and in the language that we got from City Council it really it, it really uh, deals specifically uh, that is included in all contracts contractors and subcontractors and we move uh, beyond that uh, in something like the Hampshire expansion project that is our grantee that is not our contractor and that uh, Valley CDC uh, uh, Valley CDC, I'm sorry. Is the, is the, so I think we need to we need to um, to be aware of that. Uh, um, I'm also under the assumption that all of us are in support of uh, doing something about this wage theft issue, and I got the feeling that we would want to move beyond what the city of Northampton is mandating we do, which is to have this fair wages statement that's included in all contracts that we would like perhaps something more, or at least have that discussion about what that something more would, would be. We are 
mandate at this point by the mayor and city council that included in all contracts as of the end of February is this paragraph that I hope most of us have in, in front of us. So the discussion tonight I don't think is whether to accept that or not, but whether to move beyond that or not. Is that? I'm not sure. I thought Alan Seawald had indicated we did not have to include that paragraph. That because these are grants contract. and we're not hiring anyone, we wouldn't, oh, we wouldn't be obligated to include that language. Okay, it, so we're not obligated, obligated to do money. anything at this point. No. They, they just obligated us to look at the issue. Okay. Uh, that's not quite the word, but mm -hmm. words, but something. Um, okay, well that's good to know, Linda. Thank you. So, I'll, but I'll, but I will suggest that all of us want to include something in our practices, um, and but what that something is is what what we want to be talking about tonight, um, and we'll see how far we get as we're going through this. Um, Lisa, if you know, if you want to participate, if you could just raise your hand, if that's all right. Sure, and I'd be happy. I have some handouts, so okay. I'd say a few words. Uh, now, why don't so. why if you wait for just a little bit, if sure. that's all right, and, and listen in. And, and again, if you want to contribute, I think it's very helpful to have have yours. So I thought perhaps beginning by leaving out contractors and subs, and just looking at what we want the grantee to do, and then move from that into contractor and subs, because they may be very different kinds of things. Um, so if that if that makes sense, um, yeah. You yeah. mean grantee to do as they spend themselves the grant money rather than passing it through to somebody Correct. else? Correct. So let's take contractors and subs out, out of the picture for the moment mm -hmm. and look at what we want, what we expect of the grantee. And I, and I guess I think a useful um, example would be Valley CDC with the Hampshire End project because if in fact they're doing this, how many million dollar project is it? Seven. Seven million dollar project. And they're going to be hiring a, a, I assume, a general contractor and who will hire a lot of subs. But our relationship again is with Valley CDC. It is not with their contractor nor with their subs. So perhaps I thought it would make sense to have a, to begin the discussion with what we expect from the grantee, who can also uh, have wage theft issues going on. Um, I think we're certain wage theft is a general term that, that, that we're calling, or fair wages, um, whatever it is that, that we're calling. Um, so, in, in the interest of just getting the discussion started, um, one thing that I thought, and again, sort of looking at the, the, the language that uh, Lisa gave us, um, is to, uh, again, just looking at the grantee, that we would ask that the grantee certify that it's not engaged in wage, wage theft for the last three years. If it has been in violation, then we will not, uh, then, then we will do something. And that something could be that we will not fund any project submitted by the grantee for a certain number of, of, of years after they have been found in violation. Um, and again, that is the relationship that we have, in this case with Valley CDC or whoever our grantee is. We're not talking to contractors. Um, we're not talking uh, uh, the, 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 the subcontractors. I would suggest also that if that we could, in this case, have a clawback for the grantee itself. And that if, in fact, during the uh, course of the contract, the grantee is found in violation, that um, uh, if wage theft occurs during the course of the contract, then the public money that we have given them come back to us. That's, that, that's, that's as strong as we can do. So one, we're certifying that they have not engaged in wage, wage theft in the last three years. If they have, we will, not be, we will not do business with them. If there's wage theft that is reported during the course of the contract, then that public money that we have given them come back to us. So that would be the beginning of the, that's, that's, that's a, that is a possible proposal. And Well, there's two things. 
one thing is reported and then we take it away that sounds like that sounds like guilty before you know so I don't know how you deal with that but uh -huh. that's just what it sounds like and the second thing is do we provide them with a definition of wage theft I mean wage theft is a I mean that that there may be a technical reason for that but that sounds like not paying people and clearly there are minimum wage and some other things involved I think so do we give them a definition of wage theft Chris um, this might be a time to do this um, one of the things that that we suggested the last time was we each some of us go out and do some something and I I was in contact with the license commission regarding what their actions were going to be and um, they very quickly adopted something this afternoon, which I just just got, and um, I have copies, which I'll pass around. It's very simple. What it effectively does is it, it requires all licensees to fill out a form that says one thing, which is two things, which is that um, that they're not subject to any criminal uh, or administrative um, uh, action. Um, for being in violation, and they mention this is what I meant bring this up in. They they mention a specific specific statute. Okay. Um, I don't know what that statute is, but my assumption apparently Alan prepared this for them, um, and I'm not suggesting that this be the model for what we do, but since it does mention a specific statute, that might be the way to go about handling that problem. Mm -hmm. And is that the CLO one four nine C one five one? Uh, that's in the Fair Labor Yes, 149150 of the Fair Labor Standard Act. Okay. And then there's another one further down as well, um, which is actually you're, you pointed that out. One is 149150, and then here it's 149151. So, but the point is, is that there's a, there's a specific statute that's, which they You need something. Yes. Yeah. Right. So I'll pass these around. Well, you're doing that. I'll pass mine. So. Great. And I only got a hard copy, and I'm not sure where this is online at this point. It almost looks, um, Chris, that it was a mistake in the first. I think that's what it is. So yeah. It'll be 151. Yeah. It should be 150. It should be 150. We'll, we will change our thing in the first. Oh, in the, in the dark letters? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, so, and your two points were, um, one, it's we want innocent until proven guilty. So here, uh, Here's that that they will not be that they are not subject to a federal, state, criminal, or civil judgment. Okay, um, and if they are, then we will not fund that project. Yeah. Uh, and we will not fund it for a number of years uh, following this judgment and we would have to come up with those numbers of years, correct? If that's, if that's, what, we so, if that's what we so choose to do. Um, Can I walk you through what I put out please. there? Which is, um, I can already see things I would want to change, but <laughs> I'm, um, the, first, uh, the first two are really dealing with exactly what you were addressing, Brian, which is the, I call them the recipient, but the grantee or whatever. Uh -huh. And then number three was dealing with the contractor, subcontractor, because I, I agree. I think we have to think about them very differently. So the first thing I did, and I started to put new thoughts in bold, and then I thought I abandoned that, so. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought about putting sort of a, uh, that it should involve 
projects involving a certain level of construction cost, perhaps. Um, we could, that's, so that would be one thing to discuss, and I came up with $6,000 because I was trying to keep the small grants from getting too cumbersome um, and thought that was not really our, our main target. Uh, our main target is the larger projects. Um, and the second change I made, um, it's a bit different from what you said, is I expanded <coughs> it from a look back of three years to a look back of 10 years. So if there had been a finding against them for, for the Fair Labor Standards Act or the, the state wage law within 10 years, um, that would have some consequences. And my, my thinking there, which I, I briefly mentioned last time, is that you know that's such a small window um, and lots of stuff can go on and you're not caught. Um, so having a larger period of time, given the less than aggressive enforcement that there is, uh, would give us more of a chance to really be a, be a um, be addressing those who have, who have <coughs> had problems in the past. So it gave it a, we're looking for something to give us a little more teeth and we were feeling a little toothless and this was one way to possibly make it, give it a little bit more oomph. Um, and then um, I thought we should have the right to either to determine if there had been a finding within the 10 years either determine that the applicant was ineligible or assuming that they're not actually debarred uh, on the state or federal debarred list, then to decide that there's some reason that we would, you know, it's such a good project, maybe the finding was nine years ago, maybe it was a very minimal, um, in, inadvertent or something, that we would have the have the discretion to decide to go ahead, but to then ask for a wage bond in that instance, just to, so that the flexibility resides with us, and we don't end up regretting our own policy, um, trusting trusting that we assess the situation appropriately. And then, um, so so number one is saying that they would have to certify to this stuff. Um, number two is talking about the contract that we would sign with the recipient, with the grantee, and that would require them to notify of us of any finding. Um, this, was, this is what the city had been doing as well. And here, I, I think I like your idea better. I was suggesting that in the contract, it say that if there is a finding during the period of the contract, that we would not advance any additional funds. I didn't say claw back, but I think I like your idea better. That I don't have a problem clawing back if it's the recipient themselves, the grantee that's actually um, engaged in the, in the wage violation. I don't think that's the likely case. I think the likely case is the contractor. Or the sub. Or the sub, and that's where I have an issue with the claw back. So that's so, as far well, as I went with the response. Thanks. That's that's great thinking. What tell, could you elaborate on the uh, uh, the award amount mm -hmm. and what's your thinking regarding that? So that's so the Lakewood Community Award would not be subject to anything. Well, that's not really a construction contract. Either. Well, except that they are hiring out to a firm to do herbicide work on the invasives. So Lathrop now is... But what would they serve? All right, so we're not, we're not giving not. them contractors right now. Yeah. But, but we're still giving money to Lathrop, who could be a tremendous violation of wage theft. Except they don't have any employees. Well, no, we're not giving it to them. Well... We are giving... Is it, doesn't the award go... Who does the award go to in that case? It goes to whoever applied for it. Isn't it late? Yeah. It? Yeah. Yeah. Unless it's a, unless it's like a broader coalition where they're doing work on city properties. Or yeah. sometimes it gets a little funky. So the award is to Lathrop, who could who could be, but but you're suggesting in this case. Yeah. 
I think I wasn't thinking about that, actually. Yeah, so under this scenario, Lathrop would be exempt twice, both because it, it isn't a construction project and because uh, it doesn't exceed $6,000. Yeah. Is our interest only on that project, not whether Lathrop itself has, to use them as an example, has had some kind of uh, notification in the last 12 years? We're not talking about mm -hmm. Lathrop. We're only talking about, I mean, that's what I'm trying to sort out. Chris? Um, I think we are. I think okay. we are. I think we absolutely are. And, and the reason I say that is because the state, which is the entity that's going to do the work here, is going to look at Lathrop as, and not at our project. That that's fine. That just eliminates the question of the six thousand dollars, though, because any yeah. entity then that's getting it is subject to. Okay, take that out. I'm, I'm totally <laughs> is, that, is that right? You're absolutely I mean, that right. Seems to be, yeah. Right. Okay. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. So we're back to any award. Yes. Yeah. We're back to any award. Yeah. Um, Lisa. Um, well, I was going to respond to that, but I, I could I have a couple responses. Is that okay to some of this? Um, why don't you hold off on just a, another moment, if that's okay. right. Um, and, and maybe we can work on this a little more, and then and we'll have you come up with that. Sure. So, so we're here. So, uh, other discussion. Um, Jeff, you're. Thought about this a lot, I know. Um, I had a question <clears throat> for Chris and, and the understanding of this license committee commission. So, if you have somebody that's been granted a license, there's no revocation of the license, right? I'm going to start by saying you know as much about that document as I do. <laughs> um, uh, I think, I think. Off the record, I have no idea. On the record, I mean, on the record, I have no idea. Off the record, I would say that I think the License Commission would, because they have the opportunity to review these things periodically, would then okay. weigh that as a factor in determining what they want to do with the license. Um, and certainly, um, if they were to be found in violation for whatever reason, the city could very easily say, we want a, a review of their licenses as something that they, that they uh, you know, within, it's within their purview to do. Um, but all licenses are subject to, I believe, an annual, it's either annual or, or I don't want to say biannual, because that means twice biannual. a year. Biannual. Biannual. Um, automatic, they, they, it's like an FCC license. They gotta come, they gotta come up. And it's not just liquor licenses, it's all kinds of licenses. It's uh, used cars uh, sales facilities. And so their licenses come up for a periodic review. And at that point in time, I think if they were found to be in violation, that that, that, that would be the criteria for, for not extending the license. But that's just me. Yeah. You know, I, I can't, I, I should not take that as gospel. Well, thank you. Um, I like, <clears throat> I like, um, a lot of the language that Linda threw out on the second point, I'm a little, um, I'm wondering about the scenario where the CPA funds are are front loaded um, and not drawn down over time, and then something happens, and. The solution is that the recipient shall not be entitled to receive any additional funds under the contract. And um, I kind of lean more toward what you laid out, Brian, that there ought to be some kind of mechanism to uh, that word, clawback. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with I disagree with myself, and I agree with Brian. <laughs> 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 Don't do it out. So that would mean that in the course of the contract, should the, uh, we'll call them the, the, uh, the grantee, uh, and it was the Anne's thing of, of um, be found in violation, so we're not making any assumptions here, right. then all money awarded from CPC will be returned, rather than whatever is left 
it's all of it comes back. So in the case of Valley CDC, if we in fact fully award that next time we give them four hundred fifty thousand dollars, then that then five hundred thousand would or four to fifty thousand would come back. Yeah. Um, some something that Chris had asked last time got me to, to thinking. Uh, the the first thing the first one is just a certification, and that is clearly within our since we're making recommendations to the city council, I think, uh, and we can determine whether we think somebody is eligible and therefore will be recommended. The second one, um, there might need to be some discussion with with city count the, the council with Alan Seawald about this because the contract is not between the CPC and 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 the grantee. The contract is with the. So we're sort of deciding what the city's contract terms will be. Well, I think um, you're absolutely right. Just about any of this, it's going to have to go before council, uh, before um, uh, Alan Seawall, for language. Because you're absolutely right. I mean, our con it's the city having the contract, and we're recommending. It. So. Yeah, because someone would actually have to. I mean, I, I doubt a, a grantee would willingly say, "Oh, well, we were found guilty, so here's a check for enough." Yeah. Everything that's paid us, it would be a lot more difficult. Yeah. Um, it can, uh, can we go back to, to one of Linda's things, which is the look back uh, to determine eligibility? And if, if, and if, in fact, a grantee has been found in violation, then it was suggesting a look back of 10 years with a, with a caveat there that we could say, well, Ten years ago, this happened, but nine years ago, CDC became under new management or something, right? Yeah. Um, so, are people like that idea, Chris? Um, I, I like the idea in 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 theory, uh, particularly the way Linda expressed it as being, you know, we want to be able to, we don't want to be put ourselves in a position where we're tripping ourselves up. We want to be able, to, we want to be able. To, um, I I one of purely practical question, which is on the 10-year window, is that a knowable number, i.e., the, the, do we know or can we find out if the agency that looks at these things looks back that far or has records yeah, on it? I'm just looking at the list. The debarment list is kept in perpetuity. There are not many people on the debarment okay. list. Yeah. Um, but it looks like at least easily available, you can only go back to 2015. So that that's that's that, that's a practical question. The other one is is that um, uh, while I like the sort of the escape clause component of it, I'm I'm I've, I'm wondering what it actually gets us. Um, whether we're going to have the competency to make that kind of determination. The fact that we may not doesn't mean we shouldn't have a trap door. But I'm just wondering if it's something that we're actually going to be able to utilize if, if that if that arises that we're look at it and say, yeah, but, and, and, and still be able to move forward, because, you know, we're just, we're just who we are. So, so I'm not saying you shouldn't have it in there, but I'm just wondering how useful it, it, as a practical matter it's going to end up being. Uh, Jack, do you want to weigh in on any of uh, There's a, a lot of issues going in this. I, I'm still uncomfortable with the a clawback wording, because for the legal implications, I don't know if we're set up to do the legal work that that would imply. Um, it, and also, I don't want to. I don't want people to stop applying for grants because they're worried about. I mean, that that divide between the grantee and the subcontractor and the contractor. That relationship. I don't want that in, to inhibit someone like CDC from applying for a grant. Uh, especially if they're on the hook for a clawback that might jeopardize their organization. Um, but remember, we're talking now just the grantees' wage theft issues, not, not the, the contractor sub. or the subs. Okay. In this case, the wage theft would have to be by the grantee itself, not who they are contracting or the contractor is subcontracting. Mm -hmm. So we'll discuss that later. Those are my concerns, but uh, not using someone who has 
been found guilty. It's, it's a pretty straightforward process. Not using someone where this comes up during the course of the year's period of time or whatever, I suspect these things take a long time yeah. to, to get adjudicated. So, you know, I don't know, but my question is, what's the real probability that we're actually going to take money away from somebody? I get not hiring them, but um, that we're actually going to take money away from them because something has been adjudicated. Whereas if we, if they made an application and we discovered that they were in the middle of an adjudication process, there's a different kind of question about what kind of a decision you make. I mean, they haven't been, you're not taking anything away, but you're, you're not, you know, you, you are or you're not going to have to decide whether or not you're going to accept a uh, contract from such a person, which is yet a different yeah. variable there. Chris? Yeah, well, no, actually, yeah. so maybe that's what you were just saying, because now I see, now I hear three categories. That's. Yeah, rather than two. <laughs> I think. Unlikely, as some yeah, of them yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what happens if somebody comes before you where they're in midstream? Yeah. What do we do? Yeah. Um, I, I think on the on the other one, which is um, an adjudication process, starts once we've awarded them a grant, but before the. Um, I, I I think in that one we can fence the money. We can just say it, once the process begins, you're shaking your head. That doesn't work. No. Oh, okay. I Maybe I calls the. I, oh. I was not <laughs> shaking um, my head, but I knew it. What, cause I, <laughs> As, 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 the, as the legal expert in the room, when I, when I go there, and I feel like I'm kind of watching you out of one eye. Um, uh, we could just say, we're not going to disperse any funds while, while you're under review. Yeah, and that's fine. Yeah. But it is a slightly yeah. different, that's all. It's no, just right. a slightly yeah. different I don't know process. what we do about that. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe if somebody's under review, it falls on us at that moment to say, you know, we're just not going to go there. Yeah, I think as long as we have, as long as we know in advance what it is we think we're going to. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I, I think it might be helpful for us in light of what you said earlier about other issues that we would like to be proactively championing in the future if we make the regulations on this one in such a way that it could be applied to other issues we might be doing ourselves a favor in terms of streamlining all the concerns about sexual harassment, about you know environmental safety, what other issues could come up. So I think it, it might be helpful for us to think of it in terms of a mechanism that could be used on other issues when we're awarding contracts. Uh, perhaps this would be a good time to have Lisa do her her thing. Is that appropriate sure. for you to come up now? Sure. Great. And thank you for your patience and listening. Sure. And I, I just I really appreciate being able to work with you all on this and um, the time um, and thoughtfulness and research that you're all putting into doing it. Um, and I appreciate the um, the work being done to make it be something that's real, that has substance to it. Um, so I would just say that um, uh, on the developer side, um, that not the GC subs side of it, of addressing the issue, um, I appreciate having clawback language in there. I think it's very, very, very unlikely that this, this you know, to answer your question, um, would happen. I don't know of any cases where the developer actually has wage theft issues. Um, having to do, because it's also having to do with construction, because the developer themselves are generally not doing any work themselves. Um, and so I think it's really then the, the meat of it that gets at the issue is figuring out how we address the GCs and the subs um, and responsibility on their part. Um, and I do, with, with Linda, with your proposal, on that end, on point three, I really appreciate having, though, the developer have responsibility for ensuring 
um, that the contractors are, are certified on having not having had issues in their past with the contractor that they hire because I think that's a really important piece and one of the things that we're going back to address with the mayor with the TIF executive order he did is it just addresses the recipient it doesn't address the contractors and subs um, and I think that was unintentional on his part from some of the conversations we've had and follow up with him um, but um, so I wanted I, I want to just pass out it's a little separate to what we've been talking about, but from an email conversation that I had with um, David Duke and um, Sarah was a part of it. He was just asking a little bit about kind of what the city is doing and kind of different pieces. And so I put together a short little time frame of that and then I just included the different orders and measures that have been done so far. David Drake, right? David Drake, sorry. David Duke is that horrible. I know, I thought it was. He's not allowed on that. 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 He's the other thing that I did is the initial memo that I did to you, I made, um, I changed to it, just reflecting some of the conversation that I've heard from the previous meetings I went to and feedback from a couple of members on concerns about clawback with the, having clawback on the developer for the second piece of the GCs and subs of any problem coming <coughs> under them. And so there are, there were still in that initial memo I wrote, there were a couple of other ideas on how to do that. The main thing I just would reiterate again as we go into a discussion on that or look at, as you take a look at that, is that the main gist of having some financial repercussions are to um, be a precaution so that it's enough of an incentive to not have any problems down the road. And that's what we're really trying to get at. And unfortunately, construction. There's enough players that, that operate with those kinds of problems that, that, that's needed. And so one thought as I was thinking it through and having conversations with our lawyer about it was looking at um, that the, the CPC could condition the award of <coughs> money, of CPA money, requiring that the, the, um, the developer write into a condition on their general contractor of having to have some penalties if if um, uh, wage theft is found. So it doesn't have to be, it could be, you know, it's in essence putting claw back on to, and it doesn't have to be for the whole thing, it could be for some amount, onto the GC. It's not really claw back, because claw back is only to who you give the money to, um, but it's having some sort of financial penalty. And that could be very easily written into a, a contract. And Jack, your question about concern about, you know, how, how much you put in there, um, it's pretty standard that a developer has a number of different conditions of the general contractor um, uh, that they hire, and so this could be, you know, a piece of that. So I just added um, uh, that point to it, um, and it was also asked at one of the last meetings about kind of precedent on other CPC committees, um, and there there's not precedent yet um, on this front. But I did hear from a member of um, the Newton um, CPC board that they're going to start at their next meeting looking at the same issues and looking to address it as well. Um, Rick Cronish, who's a member of that board, has decided he wants to take it up. Um, so those are just the, kind of the pieces to add that, again, um, you know, we think having clawback language provides a really good incentive on the developer to make sure the GC is playing by the rules and hiring contractors to play by the rules. I understand, though, the concerns around that, and so either retainage or conditioning the um, award of the grant um, and having some uh, conditions in there for the GC or other ways in which um, to address that issue and to have some sort of financial disincentive um, to this kind of practice taking place. So that's what I have to add at this point. Thank you, Lisa. Are the, uh, do folks have questions uh, for Lisa at this point? It's a lot to read. Yeah. 
Well, the or packet is more just the background yeah. info of the other yeah. resolutions. You do want to read it. Orders. <laughs> And my understanding too on the licensing board point is similar to Chris's that I think that the, the sense is, is that the, the sheet that they have of certifying, it could be a very similar sheet that's very simple for any, for both the developer to do, for any of their subs to do, and certifying that they have not had problems, that they're going to follow the laws. Um, but then it's that the board would then take them to consideration as they look at when the licensing comes up. Lisa, with, the, with um, the penalty on the contractor, what's your, that's between the developer and the, and the GC. So are, are you saying that that, where would that money go? That it would be the, well that's an interesting point. I hadn't really thought that through actually. Um, I think it, um, it could be saying that because we're getting, you know, taxpayer funds, that there is a fine that then goes back to the town um, who, had, who, you know, contributed towards the costs. I don't know. It could be to uh, some sort of other pool. I'm, I'm kind of open on what that would look like. I think the main thing is that there just be some financial disincentive on the GC to make sure they're having accountability of the different subs that they hire. And then what they do with their subs, what they write into their contracts, and then it's, you know, it's totally up to them, and there's no, you know, there's no getting involved in it. Um, it's just having that pathway that if, what would happen when wage theft happens is, um, say we, we often get calls from carpenters saying, uh, I'm not getting paid, can you help me out? I heard you might be able to help me out even though I'm not in the union. Um, and we, meet with those carpenters, we find out what's going on, and um, uh, sometimes it's other workers on the site as well. Um, we have them sign docu uh, do affidavits, we get copies of paychecks, or if they're being paid in cash, you know, uh, we get testimony from other workers on it. And then we connect them with the Attorney General's office um, about filing a case on it or if it's a workers' comp issue with that board um, around that issue, there are safety violations, it's, it's OSHA who's, who's getting involved in it. So we connect them with the different um, entities, but because they're understaffed and they don't have kind of time to follow up on every case, we often then are getting involved with a direct company as well. And um, I was just talking to one of our organizers today, and he's negotiating with a company with 13 workers who have been, you know, just not paid wages. Um, and because it's a group, and he's got group action, and they don't want the union kind of doing a demonstration on them, the owner is, is negotiating over it. Um, in this case, we're saying that it would only happen if the state agency is finding, you know, is doing a finding and finding some case on it. If the state sends an investigation out, determines that there, there is finding of wage theft, then that would be, you know, they would bring it, we would bring it to the attention of the general contractor, and then they would have some, some financial penalty in which to find. Well, what would be, since I haven't looked at it, what, what fin kind of financial penalties would the state, assuming there was a finding, what would happen in that instance? Would the workers be paid? Would it be just a fine? It's generally a fine and being paid. And it's not very much of a disincentive on it, which is why it continues to happen. They pay that fine and then they do it again. The, the state legislation pending right now, which passed in the Senate in the last session, and Representative Cocott is one of the co-sponsors of it, there's hope that it's going to pass in this session. It, it never was taken up by the House, so it had to be refiled. Um, but there's um, legislation around wage theft that would actually allow for the Attorney General to do stop work orders um, when it happens, mm -hmm. so that if work is shut down at that mm -hmm. site, you know, and it's just because of one sub, the GC is immediately getting involved, making sure that sub is taking care of that issue and getting that work going again. And the feeling is, is all you need is one or two stop work orders yeah. and then that'll mm -hmm. kind of pave the way for it not mm -hmm. continuing to happen. Mm -hmm. um, there, um, so, that, you know, there, there's, there's hope that it's going to go in that direction, but 
Not and some some of these things start in the bidding process that a contractor thinks they can't win a bid if they don't lowball it so that right. they they have to cut corners somewhere. Right. So it's because the materials are all pretty much the same cost. You know, you're going to um, you're you know there's only so much you can find of something that's cheaper if you're building in the same way. I mean, you can use less safe materials, but it's really through workers' comp and workers' costs wages and benefits, um, that it can be going, you can lower it, or the profit um, is, of course, how you can lower the bid as well. And so generally, our sense is the, the um, our experience is that the general contractor understands, they, they know the work, they know they're hiring someone to do concrete and, uh, you know, package a certain amount at a job, they know what if they're playing by the rules, the costs are going to come in at, um, and what the profit margin is, and whether they find that acceptable. And if they're getting some bids that are coming in pretty low, much lower than that, then they they know why. But it's kind of a you know not in a wink, and I don't really know. It's their business, how they're doing it. It's another company. I can't tell them what to do. It's going to be approach taken. Um, and what we found is that when We've worked a lot with owners of construction work on caring about this. And so when the owners are saying to the GC, we, we care a lot about wage stuff, we don't want to see it happening, um, then you know, the GC makes sure they don't take, uh, you know, use a contractor that they know uses those kinds of tactics and practices. Um, Lisa, if there was an incident where someone was uh, um, Suspect of wage theft, and word had gotten to say the attorney general. What? What? How long would that take for a ruling to to work its way through the system? Um, I I don't know. I can find that out. I, I I'm newer to the field myself. I've only been about two years in with the carpenters union. I come from doing hotel organizing, community organizing before that. So I'm newer to this world of construction. Um, do you know on that, George? I do not know the answer to I that. Mean, is it years? But no, 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 no. It's, um, I mean, it's quick enough that the Attorney General wants to have stock work orders to be able to do it in the midst of a job. And like the job that Mandy Gines came to me, you know, talked to me today about with these 13 workers, the, the job is, is ongoing, um, that he's in the midst of, um, where he's found the wage that were, these workers have come to him. Um, and the Attorney General is involved in that, I, but I don't know what the average is on kind of the time frame on it. I do know that they generally only will get involved if it's um, a company that's had a history or there are multiple cases of it, depends on what the you know, evidence is that, that, that is there. Um, and so that's part of what our organizers do is when we hear from workers is, as we're you know, telling them, we tell them to go to the Attorney General, but we also say, these are the different documentations that you're going to need, and here's some, you know, you're going to need to get co-workers. So my man was also telling me of another job in Somerville where he's uncovered a problem, but where workers aren't getting paid, but the workers are scared about going and talking um, and going as a group. And he's like, I, there's not much I can do if, you, if there's not people willing to back it up on what's happening. Um, so... It looks like there have been 10,677 complaints to the AG since January 2015. Since when? January 15. January 2015. 15. And there are some grantees on the list. So those I mean, they, but they, they could they could turn out to be nothing. Yeah. Some grantees, grantees that we have given money yeah. to. Hello. <laughs> like who? Can you? Uh, can I mean, there is oh. a lot of them turn out not to be anything. Um, the Council of Governments is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions for Lisa while she's? Would you say, Lisa, that uh, the fines from the state that you were talking about? Uh, it, would it be fair to say that for some of these people, that's um, viewed as a cost of doing business because that reminds me of large-scale retail sector wage theft where they they get this and they just go on doing what they're going to do. Yeah, workers' comp is, is 
about, you know, highest in, I think, construction than it is in just about any industry. And um, so the amount of costs that they have to pay for, that's the biggest one that they often, you know, choose to not pay and certify people as independent contractors so that it's the individual who's responsible for their own workers' comp. Um, and I know with workers' comp in particular, the fine is, you know, they basically, it's, it's hardly any fine, and they basically just have to then go get workers' comp. And so they might be a day of no work happening until they get their workers' comp up and going, um, and then they go on. You know, they're like, okay, our bad, get it, move on. Um, but meanwhile, when it's not found is where you do have, you know, uh, problems. And I, I, I remember hearing that when the senior center over here was built in Con Street, that there was somebody who had a fall on that who was not, um, did not have workers' comp um, on that job. Any other questions for Lisa? Well, thank you and welcome to stick around. Yeah. And again, if you have issues, please let us know. So we're still working on, or, or I would suggest that we're still working on not the contractors or the subs, but the grantee itself. Um, and as we said now, we've got three issues. One is that we're, we're asking the grantee to certify that, like this um, thing that Chris passed out, they have not been subject to any of these um, civil judgments. Uh, we have suggested now, if in fact they are in the middle of uh, a finding, that we withhold uh, funding until that finding is determined because I'm hearing from Lisa that's not years, that that in fact is a pretty quick process. So if in fact we, we want to move the project forward, they're saying they're innocent, we'll, we'll know that in a month or two, and that should delay the project. Um, the third thing is, uh, if in fact they were in violation, uh, we want to have a, this look back uh, period um, uh, Linda suggested 10 years, but having some sort of what we call a caveat or trap door or something uh, that would give us a discretion to do something. Uh, and Chris, uh, other people made points of, well, uh, would we know what that, you know, would, would we have enough information to be able to make that, that, that judgment? And I think we need to know whether or not what the period of time is that data is reasonably accessible. If it's only online for two years, is it reasonably accessible for 10 years? Lisa, can you answer that question? Do you know? I know you can get it from calling the Attorney General's office. There's people you can call and check a company, and that's what we used to do up until. <coughs> the putting it up on, online just happened in the last few months. So oh. it's uh, brand new that it's actually, you can go back to 2015 um, easily. But so what we would do before is do a call to the wage and hour division um, and have them do a check on a company. For every contract that we put out? Well, um, okay. I guess what though the point on this is that like the form the licensing did, it's actually not us going or you guys rather going and doing checks. It's the company certifying yeah. that they're not. Mm -hmm. And so then if there's some other interested party, like for example us, who would go and check, you know, we could then go and do the check on our own and see if they did tell the truth and, and certify it to them. And Linda's suggesting that, th and then on this form, where the licensing commission says the last three years, you're saying the last 10 years. Yes. Um, and, uh, and do we want a trapdoor caveat fall back where we can say, well, this happened nine years ago, and in fact, uh, it was resolved to everyone's satisfaction, so we want to move on. Uh, Linda suggested that, and I think, Chris, you question how. I don't, I mean, I think it's a good thing to have, I just uh, don't know if we're ever going to use it. Yeah. But, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have it. Well, the hope is we'll never have to use any of it. Right, well, that's true too. Yeah. Um, but do we, we want some some caveat, fallback, trapdoor, yes. 
Yeah, it should be, should I be. think, if, you know, maybe something that's really important to the community, we want to be able to fund it. Yeah. We don't want to have our hands tied. Uh, uh, Jeff? Um, I'm, I'm still a little conflicted about going off into the weeds on the details of this thing. Is it enough for the CPC to, to say that we support this initiative and we we would put it into our contract language and then, I mean, we're not spending our own money, we're spending the city's money and we're recommending to the city where it gets spent, but then is, is it the city's responsibility to determine who a contractor is unfit or a, 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 an awardee is un, an unfit for money. I mean, are we we're sending recommendations to the city council? Is it our responsibility to do the language and the enforce, you know, the checking and enforcement and that kind of thing? Or are, is it enough for us as a body to say we support this initiative and write language into the our contracts, but then it's really the city's job to enforce or, you know, we have no legal staff, we have no... Good. Now, well, if I heard what Lisa was saying correctly, she can jump in, it, it's not even that. It's, it's us creating um, language that puts them on record as saying we're in compliance and then whoever decides that right but, but I mean it's until we get in, into it seems like we're going into such fine detail we could just say what you just said about are you in compliance with the fair wage yeah. laws of the state and we intend that all our awardees would be in compliance and then gotcha gotcha well I think that's what I think that's what the licensing commission effectively has done mm -hmm. and no more Really, oh, they have, they have a permitting powers. Yeah. That no. Right. Right. We, that we don't have. We don't yeah. have. I may not quite be understanding what you're saying, Jack. I, um, there's I think there's different steps, and it, it gets confusing as you move from sort of one step to another step. The sort of the entry step is um, at at the at the point that we are going to make a recommendation to the city for funding. And I think that's very much within our purview to, look, to determine who we want to recommend and what the, uh, uh, what terms we want to Im impose on eligibility. And mm. that leaves, leaving aside enforcement, that's how you get in the door. Are we going to let you in the door or not? And so I was, I was trying to describe how big that door is, you know, what, <laughs> what those criteria are going to be and how we'll um, kind of make that determination. And that's just step one. Then you move to, I agree, the much harder issue of how the heck you enforce this. And I don't think we're really looking, as, as we're discussing that, I don't think we're really looking at us being the enforcement agent, the one who goes about enforcing it, I think we're making recommendations to the city about what the terms of the contract would be um, so that if, if, the, if the grantee violated that, the city, not us, mm -hmm. would have some, some recourse, there'd be some consequence to it. So that's just a recommendation from us to the city about how we would like, we think the contract could perhaps be shaped um, to, to, to give what we would like to see some tea. I, I could add to that that I, a conversation I've had with a couple city councilors and the mayor have said that they're interested in hearing what the CPC committee recommends around it and so that they are looking to this body to make some recommendations on kind of what to do around this money and, and they would then put that into effect. And I think Linda, you stated really well. We have there's sort of two tasks. One is to decide how wide or narrow the door is that we will 
that we will entertain uh, requests from grantees. And then once we do entertain those, then it's a different thing. We're making recommendations to the city to put language in the contracts, which sort of perhaps moves beyond our, our, our domain. So, um, so let's, let's get back to this, um, uh, the issue of what, what do we do if, in fact, uh, the grantee is in violation during the course of the contract, and in fact, it or is is determined that they um, they have been in violation by the attorney general or or, or uh, do we want then all of that public money to come back to us? Again, it's just we're not talking about contractors or subs; we're just talking about the grantee. Um, I think I would, I, I, I like discretion. So maybe sort of combining what you said and what I said, maybe the contract should provide that the city may terminate the contract and may ask for the money back. So it would be up to the city to determine if they're giving them the authority to do that in the contract between the city and the, and the grantee, and then the city could make the determination whether they wish to do that. Instead of it being an automatic, which I think is what you were suggesting. Yes. Yeah. Again, it's just giving some discretion. You never really know what the circumstances are gonna be, so if you wanna box the city in. Other comments on that? So we're good with the issue is. The issue is they are, during the course of the contract, they are in violation. They have been found to be in violation. Linda's suggesting that, that we may terminate work and may ask for the money back, correct? Well, I, I, I'm, I like discretion, but I also, this raises for me, um, without that, it raises for me this, the, this aspect that Jack um, raised, this idea of having a chilling effect on on potential grant applicants, um, I could I could foresee a scenario where somebody saying, um, "Look, you know, we've got this hanging over our head. We could lose all this money if one of our contractors or subcontractors is found to be in violation. Let's just not let's not bother." That was a sh that that time I was shaking my head. No, yeah, we're, okay. we're just talking about the recipient here. We haven't moved to the contractor yet. So it's gotcha, the, gotcha, the, gotcha. All right. the grant. All right. I'll hold that for later. Then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with that point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're going to have a we're going to have a grantee that's going to certify. Yes. That that they're in compliance. Yes. Right. That they're that they're following everything and everything's we're doing good. Good to go. And then. The opposite happens, and, and they're found to be violating the very process that they certified that they were not. Why would we not want the return of those of the whatever money was was fronted to them? Linda, I think. Um, well, first of all, I, I'm suggesting it would be the city, the city, not us, but. Um, uh, I guess it's lived experience. The independent contractor law is, I mean, clearly it is, the, the, the heart and spirit of it is, is violated all the time. But there, then there are also, I know from experience, some kinds of, is somebody really a consultant or are they an independent contractor and it gets very hazy and there really can be on occasion some inadvertent misunderstanding, misapplication because the description is of what constitutes a, 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 an independent contractor versus an employee in some situations, it's not a clear line and you can get on the wrong side of it by mistake. So I don't think it will happen often, um, and I think, and so those are the kinds of situations where I would 
suggests you want the discretion. Not where it's clear and somebody's not paying the 13 guys on the job. Do we think it would be worthwhile for me to contact our procurement director and the city solicitor to see if this is something the city would even be willing to do? I think as soon as we come up with any of the stuff, that, that that's the next step. Yes, definitely. Because in fact we may, as perhaps Jack was alluding to, be overstepping our bounds here. The city would say, are you, are you kidding me? But I don't think that should prohibit us from uh, coming up with language at this point or making recommendations and moving them forward and seeing what comes back to us. Sarah, you're, you're looking. I'm just pondering. Pondering. Uh, so where are we with this? I think so. We are in agreement that the let's, let's see where our common agreement is. Uh, we'll have some sort of fair wage compliance certificate that the grantee will sign, saying they have not been in violation. But we're in agreement that we're putting it back to the last ten years. Um, if they have been in violation, then uh, we will not hire them. However, we're having some trapdoor saying we might, right? That language to be determined because there may be, in fact, extenuating circumstances. Where it happened nine years ago, they've had spotless record for the last eight and perhaps will be okay. Um, uh, if, in fact, they are in the midst of, uh, of investigation, then we will withhold funding until results of that have been determined. Sorry, you're doing so well, but I was, I was thinking practicalities, and if we find out about it as we're trying to make determinations on funding, I guess you could do a two-part if, you know, awarding, if, if they're found, if the funding goes, it gets them, then they don't get the funding if they, the finding is uh, favorable to them and they do get the funding. I mean, it just gets very messy as we're trying to choose between projects if this is kind of bad. They can defer it till next time. Right. Just a, no, it's just I guess right. three people had that thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Right. So defer to the next round. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh -huh. well, yeah. What, is, what is an investigation actually look like, like for example, we could go and say, has someone made a complaint against you? Oh, someone's made a complaint against the, ha the Hampshire Council of Governments. Does that mean it's under investigation? I, I don't know how, how we would determine that. I mean, presumably the, the Attorney General has to check all of these out one way or another to, to get them off their open complaints list. Uh, Lisa, but most of them don't result in violations. Well, my reading of it is that we're talking about having a finding, so not an investigation, right. not but, but an actual finding, that there has been a finding by a state agency of uh, wage theft, of a violation of, you know, a certain aspect of the Fair Labor Standards Act. But a finding means they're guilty. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, the question here, and so we know that, if they're guilty, we're not going to we're not going to do it. Okay, I thought Sarah was raising that they could. No, I think the issue is what if, what if there have been complaints filed? Um, and the question is, if there are complaints filed, do we then not award the contract? Um, and because anyone can file a complaint, right? right. Linda. Uh, well, I thought I was hearing from Lisa earlier that not all com complaints are really followed up on. So I mean, you, you might sort of be putting somebody in purgatory. I mean, the council. When was the council and governments one filed? Uh, Maybe it was recent. I don't know, but I'd be concerned that. Yeah, I mean, I just don't know how we would even be able to tell if someone's under a legitimate investigation. Or no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we may be trying to get too clever mm -hmm. here. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to rely to some extent on the attorney's office, attorney general's office to do what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Uh, Chris? But either way, I don't think it requires that we 
drafting the language on the two-part whereases and that kind of thing, I think that during the course of our deliberations, if it comes to our attention, that's something that we just weigh and we don't care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, and then the last part is, if in fact a, a, a finding is determined during the course of the investment, during the course of the contract, um, then uh, we have the discretion to yank the contract and to pull all public, all public funding back. But Linda's suggesting, A, we have that ability to do that rather than we will. Mm -hmm. But Jeff said, we, Jeff, you disagreed with that saying yes. we, want, we want strong language. So there are two, two schools of thought about well, that. Another thought I just had when you read that off, Brian, was what if we um, once again made a recommendation to the city council to do exactly that and, and pull the funds instead of just leaving it to the discretion of the, of the city to do that on their own? Oh, so that there'd be a second tier of our activity? One, <coughs> once it became known. Right. Yeah. 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 And then it's like, all right, it's up to the city to do this, but as a CPC, this is our recommendation, the same way we would recommend any of these things to be funded in the first place. Do we have any, <clears throat> not related to this, but do we have any other scenario whereby we go back to the city council and say, we've changed our minds on this? No, I mean, basically once city council allocates the money, it's between, um, the committee and, and its staff and, and the grantee. And we're out of the picture. No, no, the, so this committee and its staff and the grantee, the city council oh. is, is no longer involved. The city council. Oh, interesting. Can I say that again? So the city council allocates the funds um, and they are then available for use by the, the grantee, but they're not really involved beyond, so Sarah beyond runs the establishing show. those funds. So you run the show. Well, I mean, you, you were all the authorized to do that. Just sure. <laughs> but, but we don't have the authority to exercise terms under a contract. Yeah. I mean, if, if I mean, I guess all of our grantees are fairly cooperative. No one's ever really fought back. If someone says, oh, here's an invoice, and we say, well, you haven't done this and this, we're not going to give you your money until you do it, then they've all been good about either giving up on the project or making sure those terms are complied with. Hmm. So, hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do we want to deal with this, with this last one? Because I think we, we're in agreement about the, uh, I'm sensing an agreement, and Jack is still yeah. looking, uh, yeah. except for this last clawback of, uh, of, um, what do we do in the course of the contract if they are found in violation? And is it a yes? Yeah, is it a um, they they give they give the money back, or if it's they may have to give the money back? Uh, so we have two two possibilities there. Do we want to take a little straw vote? Who thinks they should definitely? I I'd, I'd like to go with what I the last thing I said instead of just saying you automatically give it back. I'd still like to see some someone else make I'd like to see us once again say this recommend although Sarah's telling me we don't have to do yeah. that. Yeah, I mean we're this committee is essentially the project manager for yeah. these grants. So at that point then I'd like us to to, to again um, pass pass a resolution or pass a agreement or whatever we're going to call it, asking for the return of funds if we think it's warranted, with giving the discretion that, you know, what well, we might not. Okay. Yeah. I, I like that. I mean, we could come up with some boilerplate language that, that becomes a, sort of a, an automatic condition, which says, look, if this is something that fits Jack's model of how do we do this for other, you know, Whatever, whatever types of things we decide we might get into in the future, but language that says, "Look, you, you, you've agreed to take our money, and if you do this, you should be aware of the, the fact that the, that this is what we have in place to, to come after you." Yeah. 
I like it. Yeah, I do too. Okay. Which is a yes, we will do this. No, yes, we can do this. Oh, yes, we, we can. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, reserve the right to do this. Reserve the right. Okay. Yeah. So everybody's in agreement with that. I'll withhold my stronger language. And in the hopes that we would be assertive. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think we will. I think we will. At least this mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are, are, are okay. Sarah, how are you doing in recording? Okay. Oh, this, I think I'm good. <laughs> okay, this is going to be a challenge to take. But Sarah's a, a mistress, master at taking our, taking what what we give her and putting it into something that makes some sort of sense, uh, which we'll look at at some other point. Um, are we good with the grantee then? I think we're sort of there. Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Um, and then we're just going to have to review all this stuff at some at some other point. But I, I, I can't see the time. 8.30. 8 um, can, we, can we see how far we can get with the contractors and subs? Yes? Um, and then maybe go till nine. How does that sound? Okay. Um, and then remember, we have a special treat at the end. <laughs> we'll take no, 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 no. And Lisa, you're required to stay. <laughs> if you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, all right. So we're good with the grantee. Now we're going to say that the grantee will require that the contractors and subs sign the same fair wage compliance certificate, mm -hmm. correct? That they, have, that they are not subject. Um, and in fact, if they are, then uh, the grantee will disbar them from the, from the job, correct? Uh, again, do we want to say that within the last 10 years? So here in the license agreement, it's three. Um, Linda bumped that up. Uh, even Lisa has three years on this. So we are moving beyond that and really looking over a decade's worth of fuck up. Excuse my language. Um, Transgressions. Transgressions. So is 10 years. So let's keep that in mind. We can come back to this. but. The grantee will require that the contractors sign this and all subs sign this as well. Correct? Okay. Um, and in fact, if the contractors and sub and the subs have have been found, then they will not be they will not be hired to do the job. We're all agreeing on that. We'll, we can come back to the to the year thing. Uh, so. Now, if wage theft uh, occurs by a contractor during the course of the contract, then what happens? During the course of our contract with the grantee. Of our contract with the grantee, the contractor or subcontractor, a finding is determined that they are in violation. Now, if you, I'm looking at the second page of what Lisa gave to us in her new language, which says that um, that the general contractor will require, um, or the I'm sorry, the grantee in this case. I think uh, uh, Lisa is using different language from us rather than the developer, that the, that the grantee will require that the general contractor give back public money. Could I just add one more piece before we get to this trickier part, yeah. is um, that it's a small thing. It's kind of like the same, similar to the affidavit on that they've not had a um, finding over the last 10 years. Um, that we require the contractors to sign an affidavit that they are going to follow all of the wage um, and hour laws. Um, we have found that 
getting them to positively affirm it at the beginning, again, kind of puts them on notice that, that we care about this issue, and so it makes, it helps deter them from not following one of those laws. So it would be a similar, you know, it could be worked into the same, perhaps even one page of, no, we haven't had a, a finding, and yes, we will follow all the laws if we are hired for this project. Finally, one thing that might get a little sticky with this one, um, the, the largest construction projects that we've had a, a play in funding, our money has only gone to acquisition. So the term of our contract can sometimes be three days. And then once they've, once our grantee has provided us an affordable housing restriction generally, um, and they, they bring this check to closing, we're no longer involved. Right, and so in that case, we're no longer involved, I think. Okay. I mean, so our contract specifically states that we are acquiring the land, then there's no contract, there's gonna be no contract or subcontract. So that will take, all of the large construction projects out of this discussion. Well, so not half that. Valley CDC, none of those projects would come into play the way that this is framed currently. Well, the, the, the potential Valley CDC, they've already got the money. Well, this one, yes, this is the first one. Yeah, Every okay. other one has okay. just been yeah. in acquisition. But projects like uh, Historic Northampton would be different because yeah. they're and I don't have feelings either way, I'm just making sure that, that that's clear. I mean, if our contract is for land acquisition, then that's the scope of the contract. Well, so. another, <clears throat> another one of Lisa's points on her page um, talked about retainage, where you give some of the CPA funds up front and put some others of it in escrow to be awarded at the end of the project. Sarah, we, we never give money up front. Unless it's for acquisition. Unless it's for acquisition. So we only pay after invoices have been submitted, correct? Yeah, but retainage, like um, DPW does, a, does this with the Pulaski Park project. For every X amount of dollars that are submitted in invoices, another, a uh, smaller percentage of that is set aside as retainage. Until the entire project is completed. But that's a that's a situation where there there there's a series of payments occurring. They're not it, it's not it's being done on an installment plan. It's not it's not an all or nothing mm -hmm. the way an acquisition would be. Yeah, I mean I don't I don't think we could do it yeah, in trade acquisition. It's yeah, the cost is worth it. Yeah, because the project can't. In some cases, I could imagine the project couldn't start if they didn't have all the acquisition mm -hmm. money available. Now, I, um, I was kind of half aware of this issue. So I was thinking that our contract, even though the contract, uh, I'm not sure the contract is necessarily over. Can't we, um, can't we in our contract with the grantee say when you do enter into a contract with the GC, you must include this language in the contract. Um, I mean, what, you get, yeah, why, why can't we do that? And what language is that? The, la the language saying that the, con that the, the contractors then has to certify and yes. that they're in compliance and will comply and so forth, so that the language would we could insist that the language end up in the contract with the contractor, even though we've already expended all of, all of the funds. So what's our or yeah. else in that situation? Yeah, well that's what gets harder. If, if um, well maybe the contract isn't really over at that point because mm. it's a slow bit. Are, are you talking about slow. when when we're simply acquiring the land yeah. for the project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The or else gets the harder part. But I think we I mean the or else is with somebody like Valley, if they haven't done it, they come yeah. They know that we're not gonna look very favorably on their 
getting funded for another project. Right, I was going to say, I think I'm the same suspicion the or else is don't come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think we can make conditions that are outside of our contract with them. If our contract is for land acquisition for a affordable housing project, then that's the scope of our contract. Yeah. And we can't say, well, if you're doing something beyond the scope of our contract, we're... But the acquisition is in... I mean, we're funding the acquisition because they have proposed that they are going to do X with the land. And we're funding it not for the acquisition because that doesn't get us anything. We're funding it for the ultimate housing that's going to be rehabilitated or built or, or whatever. So I'm not sure we can't sort of in furtherance of the community housing. So this may be your chilling effect, though, right there. But I don't know that we got the the chilling we effect. Don't have the clawback. We just have the you have to put it in your contract, and if you don't, yeah. Lisa, we're not going to like you. Sorry to interject on that. Um, Please. I mean, I think Help the us. chilling effect, though, is just. I mean, what we're in s what we'd be in the essence saying is agree to follow the law, agree to hire someone who's going to be following the law, and um, there's a penalty if you don't follow the law. The chilling effect is only on how harsh that penalty is, and whether the, the contractors are looking to how closely they are planning to follow the law. Um, I mean, I can't, you know, I, I just my premise would be, I, I would be very surprised that some CDC, Valley CDC, or some developer would not be wanting funds for developing with the idea that, you know, there's a problem if they hire people who don't follow the law. I mean, I think they're going into it with the expectation that whoever they hire is going to be following the law. And so they're then putting that onus then it's written in some way so that onus is on who they hire to again follow the law. We have not found in practice where it's been, this has been done by many owners, that you'd get all of a sudden nobody willing to bid on a project because there's language in there that they have to follow the law. Um, contractors are still going to bid on the work. So in practicality, how would we how would we know whether it's for a, whether we fund a construction or whether we fund an acquisition? I, I don't know who Valley CDC selects to hire. Are we going to ask for copies of contracts with their GC and then copies of the contracts between the GC and the subs? Thoughts? How far down the line do we go? Require documentation. And we we're out, anything that that we get is going to be subject to the public records law, and we'll have to keep it. I don't and think we're asking for, for any enforcement. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're asking for any extra enforcement on our part or or them to have to do more in showing us stuff. I mean, so we're, we're, but otherwise we're asking them to do it and not, we're just, we never have, we'll never have any way to see whether they've done it or not. Well, the, the only way is if a third party is bringing it forward that they have not. Um, and that's and currently employees, how, for instance. Right, and that's currently how these issues come to light because third parties and employees are through, they connect up with a union or a worker center or community organization who help them get recourse on it and, um, and then it's then brought to light that there was a problem on that site. I mean, I think. As we looked at this issue of bringing it forward to you and on, in the other venues of bringing it forward to the mayor and the city council, was with an understanding that this is a small town government, that there's not the, the staff and the resources to be putting, you know, having to go out and do inspections or worksite visits or any of that. We know that's not realistic and um, there aren't the resources for doing that. So I don't think it would be. So it's in that same nature, it's more of, you know, affidavits of affirming that, that you will do this and of putting it in our contract that you will do this. So are you still concerned? I mean, we're still, we're asking a grantee to do something 
and are not ever going to follow up on it? Why? Well, with the with the closeout report, can you just have them certify that that they included the language in the contract? I mean, it's at least a reminder. It's some kind of follow up. And, but then we're just asking for another. I mean, it's just a lot of certifications and without any without, follow -up. without any follow up. I think it's really, I mean, for the way I see it, is it's really putting protections in there in case the problem is uncovered. And it's not. And then we go looking for it. Right. It's not looking for to, to do a lot of the front end of, of it. It's more of having something in place so that it's not just saying, oops, um, wish we had, you know some recourse, but having some recourse written in, and then hoping also as well, and, and we found that to be the case in this industry, that by having repercussions written in, it can be a good uh, disincentive for, a, for the bad behavior. But there's no repercussions in this case. Well, and that's what we're trying to figure out. Well, we can't have repercussions for the sub. Well, so this is the, this is the sticky question. If, in fact, we contract with um, Valley CDC and we have the contract, we require Valley CDC to have the contractor and all of their subs sign statements saying that uh, they're not subject, blah, blah, blah. So now we have all that done. But in the course of the work, uh, wage theft occurs. What do we do? What do we require the our contract with the con with the um, uh, what, what, what are we calling them the grantee to do the electricians? What does the attorney general do? The attorney general requires. It it's been brought to light. We're just asking them to follow these laws and to make sure that they right. follow. Right, now we've asked them to follow the laws, they have violated the laws, and the Attorney General has determined that they have violated the laws. Mm -hmm. And the Attorney General is now requiring them to pay workers' comp and they get a few thousand dollar fine, but what do we do? Because they in some way benefited from having public funds yeah. be a part of the project. And then they I mean, we, we could, uh, uh, I mean, could we say that at the point of finding, the grantee will disbar them further from the project? That gets very hard because if you've got a project that's got um, many sources of funding, it's got a particular budget. Um, Everybody's waiting for everybody else to do that work. And you kick out the GC at that point. Who knows whether you're going to be able to get somebody else to come in and finish the work for anything like the original contracted amount, and you may end up totally messing up the project. Okay. So you're suggesting against the uh, the grantee disbarring from the project the violator. That we have to require that we require that the grantee do that. Okay. Do but people agree with that? That that is that would be too extreme a penalty to admit project should a finding occur that puts a contractor or sub in violation that they that they then be dis that the, that we uh, force the grantee to disbar them from the project. That is suggesting that would create havoc with stuff and lead to the downfall of an affordable housing project or whatever. Ceasing anything in mid-project causes okay. problems. I mean, yeah. it's, that's, you know, if you're going to, if you run into that and actually have to make anybody quit anything in mid-project, it's, it's going to cause problems. It, it seems to me that the further we get um, from the infraction in sort of the food chain, 
the harder our ability to impact and process is, is going to become. Right. Um, and I, I kind of go back to where Jack was, which was, what does the Attorney General do? Well, um, there's a, a nice statement in Lisa's form here at the, the very last uh, sentence said, the city would not have to employ enforcement officers or do oversight. It would simply require the developer or the general contractor to monitor the signing and submission of affidavits and would have consequences in place in case fraud is found and is substantiated. Right, and, so, the, and the issue is what are the consequences? Right, right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I would take that up with the city attorney. Yeah. Well, I think the city attorney was very, correct me if I'm wrong, when he spoke to us, very not in favor of clawback saying that's a can of worms that... Yeah, but then it's got a fraud, there's a fraud issue they, when they signed something that said they were going to do something. And now they're in violation of that. Okay. So yeah. there's a, there's a, I mean, what part of what Alan was saying is that we're, like we're giving to Valley CDC. Valley CDC is not really going to be the developer. They're going to form a whole separate entity. That entity is going to enter into the contract with the GC. That GC is going to enter. But they control that entity. They, they set that entity up for the project. Yes, they do, but. Right. But I, I, I mean, what Alan was, what I read or heard too from Alan is that, and, and similar from you, Linda, is that the, the chain of command with clawback in particular he finds worrisome and hearing that is where I suggested that it instead be a condition of the award to the general contractor and that no it's that we don't want to go way down the food chain and say oh this you know having to deal with a sub sub who has the problem but the general contractor is the one who's writing all of the contracts and the general contractor is who our grantee is either having the direct relationship with or they've set up an entity for this project who has a relationship who hires that general contractor. Um, I mean, Hap Housing hired Western Builders to do this project over here um, uh, and Valley CDC would hire a general contractor for building for, for their housing development project. Um, and so I'm, I would argue that there should be some financial penalty and it doesn't have to be the whole amount of the grant or anything like that, but just some sort of financial disincentive that would ensure they have greater oversight over working to make sure wage theft is not happening on their project. So and some and sort of what would that financial penalty be? I'm not, look, I'm looking at you, Lisa, but asking. Hmm. The devil's in the details. Um, and where would it go to? Well, don't worry about where it'll go to. You get a room full of lawyers and a pot of money, and you'll find it gets spent. So, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> watch your language. I'm just saying, it doesn't have to be lawyers. You get a room full of well-intentioned human beings and a lot of money, and they'll still get spent. I think I think the function is the economic disincentive, um, right? And whether or not we want to be in the dis disincentive biz business as as this entity, um, so. Thoughts? Yeah, this is where I, I begin to feel like we're trying to do too much. I mean, we want to be on the right side of this issue. We, we want to do that in a meaningful way, and I think the reason all of us have had our arms crossed most, most of the evening is because it's really hard to figure out um, how to Checks do this balances. and how to do it right. Mm -hmm. and, well, I actually think we've done a pretty good job yeah. getting to this last. But this is the this is the I, I think Lisa is right. Unfortunately, that this, this is, is the, the this is the meat of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this is where this the is scenario that is most likely. This is where the violations are going to happen. What I had suggested, sort of at the end, you all probably got weary, and it's and it's not a financial um, penalty that e either the owner, meaning the developer here, or the city of Northampton. Um, if there were a finding 
could to, could require the wage bond. I don't know. Do you know how much a wage bond costs? What kind I of? Don't. I mean, that's going to be some some financial penalty. But to, I could look into that to and the bring some information to the contractor, and that if they didn't, that that if they didn't do that, so that would ensure hopefully that people would really be paid for the rest of the the balance of the contract. And if they didn't do that, that that, that would be grounds for termination of the contract by the owner developer. Um, I just like to. Uh, offer a couple of observations. One is I want to echo what Brian said, which is I think we, particularly with the, the first part, we did, a, I think we did a lot of really good things. Um, I also don't think that, um, I know a lot more than I, than I did four hours ago. And um, in part that has to do with the fact that I didn't know all that much and I know, now know a lot more. <laughs> no, but seriously, I, and now I know a lot more. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't feel the pressure of time on this, and um, the fact that we've gotten to this point and we see a you know a thorny issue in front. I'm not advocating back burnering it or anything like that, but I you know I don't think this I don't think our clarity will suffer from a little more time. So no, I I agree with you, and it will be nice to have Sarah work her magic and come up with la the language yeah. that she thinks we have. <laughs> uh, right. The whole her so that we can actually have something in front of us yeah. that we can then get it. to. And that would probably take her three months to get her signature. But in the few minutes that we have remaining, I mean, if are there other thoughts on what, if any, this this most likely scenario should be? A sub of a sub is is in violation. Now what? Um, People have said, well, to disbar them, no matter what their role is from the project, has the potential to create havoc. Because, in fact, it may not be a so so it may be the contractor itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so we yank the contractor two-thirds of the way through a $20 million housing project, and all hell breaks loose. And now we have, I mean, our goal is affordable housing. We want a bit, it to be done without wage that, but, but um, maybe there are no bonds. So what is, is there a financial disincentive that we can kick in other than to say, all right, if you're knowing that if you're uh, f found in violation, we will not be doing business with you for the that, next 10 years. Well, that's... Or ever. Yeah. Ever, you know. yeah. Well, that's I think I think that's the well, that's okay. I think that's the answer. Yeah. We won't do business with you if, if, again. Yeah. I, I I kind of think I mean again going back to um, Lisa's document on in the second page on number five GC reporting and fines and then some of the earlier discussion about isolating the GC because that's the entity that's really running the whole show. So you don't go after the sub of the sub. Um, you don't go all the way down the food chain, but you you hold the you hold the GC responsible um, for running the process that that ensures that sub of the sub got into got into the door in the first place. And I think there should be some kind of financial penalty. And right now, I'm not. I don't know what that what that is. But I think, as far as the next time this is brought up, that might be one of the one of the clauses to to think about what what that might actually look like in a real a real situation. I think it would be useful, Lisa, if you at least for me, if you could provide Sarah with some information about the cost of wage bond. Yeah, I can do that, and I can also research into. To what extent the different penalties that there are that yeah. the state has, yeah. and um, um, if there are other examples, you know, we know it's not with CPC funds, but with other types of things where there have been financial penalties for uh, for issues like this. Um, so I can look into those three areas and get back to Sarah to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And do you feel like you have enough to work on, Sarah, to, yeah. that when we meet again, there can be language that we can then begin to do our due diligence? And I'll also run the initial clawback discussion that we had on the city solicitor. I mean, it might just be a, a veto at that point, in which case the discussion is going to be a lot different. That's great. And somehow we're going to have to remember what took place here when we come back in September, which will be a challenge for me, and then we won't have to redo the entire conversation, but we will have a lot of language that Sarah has. We could meet, um, we should meet once more to approve the contracts and MOU for this round anyway, uh -huh. following whatever it is that they're able to get approved by council when we have no plan. Okay. And also to set the schedule. Um, so, d does that, I'm sorry, does that meeting wait until after, uh, after the council approves? It doesn't have to. I mean, we can have the meeting assuming that council will approve these, these projects, and if it doesn't, we won't need the contracts and then we'll anyway. Okay. So that would be in two weeks? Or whatever works for people. How people We're feel, gonna, uh, today is the, what? Today is the third. Um, do we want to meet in two weeks? Do we want to wait to the first Wednesday in June? Um, I think I'm, I'm going to be gone off and on a good deal. I'm afraid that much of this will slip out of my brain if we let too much time go by. So I'd like to, as soon as enough people are available to try to What's, what's the date on two weeks? 17. 17th? Yes? Okay, I'm seeing enough nods, Chris. No, I'm good with that. Yeah, Linda? Yes. Okay, so let's do the 17th. And Lisa, you're welcome to the PA. Continue to. You're lucky. To, uh, Along here. So we have enough to go, and so we, we, we can get those, those those contracts that we can take a look yeah. at yeah. to us by then, and have some sort of rough draft of this stuff so we can yeah. perhaps revisit it again. Yes? All right, I think we did actually some reasonable stuff. And that was very good. That was good, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Linda. Yeah. Brian. And Lisa. Thank you. Um, so before we leave, uh, can't find it uh, uh, is there any other business not foreseen when agenda was published? Okay, then before we leave, it's still part of the official meeting. Yep. As a can we adjourn? Uh, oh yes. Is there? We'll do this after adjourn. <laughs> is there a motion to adjourn? Yeah. So, second. second. Yeah. All in favor. Okay. Um, and